Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Hoover, Hoover Virtual Policy Briefing Series. My name is Tom Gilligan, and I'm the director of the Hoover Institution. For more than a century, the Hoover Institution has been collecting knowledge and generating ideas that support freedom and improve the human condition. Our work has profoundly affected, uh, our work has profoundly impacted public policy initiatives in the United States and around the world. We're excited to be able to connect virtually with you to showcase the important work coming out of the institution. This policy briefing is an opportunity for you to hear directly from some of our nation's top scholars on the pressing issues facing the world during this difficult time. As we all unite to confront the challenges of, world, of this worldwide pandemic, conversations like this have never been more important. We hope you enjoy and find value in our discussion. As a reminder, we will be taking questions and encourage you to submit yours at using the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. The title of today's briefing is uh, COVID-19 in China, the political fallout. Uh, in today's briefing, we'll get to hear from two of our Hoover fellows, Michael Oslin, who I'll refer to as Misha, because that's his name, he's my friend, and Lan He Chen. Michael Oslin Misha is a research fellow in contemporary Asia at the Hoover Institution. He specializes in current and historical US policy in Asia and political and security issues in the Indo-Pacific region. He's a best-selling author, and his latest book, Asia's New Glo Geopolitics, is available for pre-order on Amazon. Lan He Chen is a fellow in American Public Policy Studies at the Hoover Institution and Director of Domestic Policy Studies in the Public Policy Program at Stanford University. In 2012, he was the Policy Director for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign and served as a senior appointee at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services during the George W. Bush administration. Misha and Lani, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Tom. Misha, I'd like to start with you and, and just ask you a question out of the news. Yesterday, uh, there was a report that several of our U.S. intelligence agencies have concluded that the facts coming out of China with respect to infection rates and deaths associated with the COVID-19 virus are not accurate. Could you tell us a little bit more about those reports and what you know? Sure, Tom. The, uh, the report uh, is really a confirmation of what so many people within China and outside of China have been asking, which is, can we trust what is actually happening with uh, the numbers that the, the communist government is telling us? Um, this is really the breaking of the dam. There has been an enormous amount of information coming out that uh, from social media, uh, from people inside China, questioning the official numbers. Uh, and not only those that are in Wuhan itself, but with throughout the whole country. Um, this goes, is tied into, that goes back to, but it's tied into the much larger question of what did the communist government know in China at what time and what was it doing about it? Because it, it gave a picture to the world that it, it knew early on about the, the, the dangers of this disease, that it acted resolutely and boldly, that it um, uh, you know, locked down Wuhan. And yet the truth is that the, the government knew uh, months before it told the rest of the world just how dangerous this disease was. It knew that it was transmitted between humans, but it misled the World Health Organization. It misled the global community. It let millions of people leave Wuhan for the Chinese New Year, the Lunar New Year, and who were potential carriers, and therefore spreading the disease not only around Wuhan, but around the world, including Italy and other places that were very badly hit. So the intelligence community report is important because it's the first official recognition that we can no longer trust the information coming out of China, coming out from the Chinese government, and that we need to verify everything that they say, not only because it's a, a moral issue to know the truth about what happened, but because if we don't, and if we simply trust Beijing, we will put ourselves at risk once again for a pandemic or something else where Beijing tells the world one story while it knows the truth is something else. Lonnie, tell us how accurate information out of China is important for combating the virus to spread around the world. Well, it's critical, uh, Tom, for a number of different reasons. First of all, uh, we rely on information about the extent of the virus, where it is uh, hitting different parts of the country, for example, with respect to China, 
uh, there were questions about early travel restrictions and the United States acted resolutely to put those travel restrictions in place early, which I think was the right thing to do. But if we don't have a sense of where people have gone, and this was one of the critical things early on in the coronavirus outbreak here in the United States, if we don't have a sense of where those people are, where they're going, and whether they're symptomatic, whether they're in fact able to spread the virus, these are all questions uh, that researchers have been trying to wrap their arms around. And the most important variable in all of this was time. And the challenge is we lost a lot of time early on uh, when it wasn't clear the extent of the outbreak, when it wasn't clear exactly how many people had traveled in and throughout China until they put a quarantine in effect. A lot of those things weren't well known. And so I do think the challenge that we're facing now is that we have a outbreak of a virus that for some has been, uh, has been deadly. And the amount of information we were getting out of China early on uh, really did not reflect the severity of this. And there were a number of different global actors, a number of different other countries uh, that tried to sound the alarm on this. Unfortunately, uh, it, it just wasn't something that I think a lot of people got caught by surprise, uh, frankly, how challenging this was. Now, there are a few countries that didn't. We could talk about that later. We could talk about the ways that South Korea and Singapore and Taiwan were able to effectively uh, control this virus early on. Uh, but certainly here in the United States, I do think that the lack of transparency coming out of China early on, uh, the degree to which this virus really was in our communities before we realized it because we didn't have adequate testing early on, uh, those are all things that we'll look back upon and realize had a significant impact on our ability to effectively fight the virus. Yeah, Lonnie, let me ask you that about this. I mean, the world in some sense prepares for these global public health threats and the United Nations has an organization, the World Health Organization, that's designed to do that. What has their role been in this process, and what have they done to try to assure the quality of the information coming out of China? Well, the World Health Organization is a multilateral body that is affiliated with the United Nations uh, that is really designed to deal with public health challenges that cross national borders. So, you know, when we think about some of the major health policy challenges, public health challenges of our time, the World Health Organization has really been at the center of trying to deal with those and for many years has played an active and important role in things like fighting polio, uh, dealing with outbreaks. Uh, but there have also been a number of ways in which the World Health Organization has fallen down on the job to the point where today I'd argue the WHO is broken. Uh, if you look back, for example, at the way in which they handled the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, that was really a, a prime example of how an international organization should not handle a crisis, should not handle an outbreak. Uh, it was slow to the punch, eventually leading to the death of 11,000 people uh, in Africa and, and creating a situation where a lot of people around the world didn't feel that they could trust the WHO to do the right job. There was a lack of transparency in how the organization made decisions. There was a lack of accountability in its decision making. And then the, the third problem that I think has become much more apparent uh, in the last few, uh, really last few weeks and months, is the degree to which China has managed to influence the leadership of the organization and how the organization makes decisions. And it's been particularly deadly with respect to the current coronavirus outbreak. Uh, and we saw it from very early on when the WHO simply accepted what the Chinese were saying regarding the lack of human to human transmission of the COVID-19 virus. Uh, it was exhibited in the degree to which they continued to laud Chinese efforts to contain the virus when it was very clear the virus was nowhere near contained within China. Uh, and of course, the WHO did not see fit to declare this a pandemic until March 11th, when coronavirus, when the novel coronavirus had affected over 100,000 people in 114 countries around the world. So the WHO, and we could talk more about this, unfortunately, I think has become too susceptible to influence uh, by member states, and in particular China, is one whose influence has become quite dramatic and quite noticeable. And oftentimes you see the World Health Organization favoring politics over public health, and we can't have that. Interesting. 
For those of you who are just tuning in, I'm Tom Gilligan, and this is the Hoover Institution's Virtual Policy Briefing with Michael Oslin and Lan He Chin. Misha, I know that you do a lot of research on Chinese-influenced activities around the world and within the United States. Could you pick up on Lan He's comments about the influence of China in the World Health Organization may have limited that organization's effectiveness? And do you see that in other international institutions around the world? Right. I think what this is is a perfect test case of, of the way in which China over the past decades has used its economic power, its growing political influence, its activities around the world to present a picture that is not always coherent with reality about the ways it acts or the ways it, the ways it pushes its own agenda on institutions and organizations. Uh, and the ways in which, as Lan, he was saying, it often suborns them. The World Health Organization is one example where it does not allow Taiwan to be a member. Uh, the International Civil Air Organization is another uh, where China has used to squeeze pressure on Taiwan. Uh, it has used its aid around the world, whether that's the One Belt and the One Road or direct bilateral aid packages, uh, to buy support for political policies. Uh, it, it's done so in Europe, uh, where countries like Greece, for example, blocked an EU statement on human rights in China uh, because the Greek government was getting aid from the Chinese government. We saw it with the Czech Republic. We've seen it with Hungary. We've seen it over and over. It, it's part of what sometimes people call debt trap diplomacy, where China offers large amounts of aid uh, to countries that need it desperately. but in order to get that aid, there is a quid pro quo. Uh, it is using these organizations, such as the WHO, to push a line that, the again, these more vulnerable nations are willing to accept because they want what they believe are the benefits of closer relations with China. It's very dangerous. It's a very dangerous moment for global governance. We all understand the limitations to global governance. We understand the flaws. But if you believe that many of these institutions are important, at least for an attempt to try to regulate and, and deal better with the problems that we face, then what we're seeing today is a perfect example of the limitations, not only of those organizations, but of the degree to which we can trust China acting in those organizations. Mm -hmm. We are past the point in time where we can simply accept everything that China says on face value. It's a little bit like the Surgeon General's warning that goes on cigarettes. You know, believing the statements of the Chinese government can be hazardous to global health. That's where we are right now. Let's be clear that the world is facing this pandemic because of what Beijing did not do. The information it did not share, the information that it suppressed, and that it presented instead a completely false picture of, of the pandemic and what it was doing. And while every national government is responsible for it, its own response, the world would have been spared an enormous amount of suffering if China had acted as it was morally and, quite frankly, legally bound to do so under the international health regulations. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go right to a question because I think it bears me on what you just said. Scott asked, could you elaborate on what benefits China gains by being deceptive regarding the uh, China virus? Well, it, it gains, uh, well, first of all, what it, what it does is not um, lose all the benefits that it's gained from years of presenting a very, uh, a very coherent propaganda picture to the world about China's strengths, about China's, uh, about China's innovation, about its win-win uh, its policies for the world, the way in which it's an altruistic uh, global actor, if not global leader. Much of that could have been undermined uh, if China had told the truth about what was going on uh, in China. I mean, ironically, if China had been fully transparent from the beginning, we all would have appropriately praised China for helping us avoid or dodge the bullet that, that we're actually now absorbing. So that's one way. Uh, another way is a very domestically oriented one, which is that the Communist Party is deathly afraid of its own people. It is afraid, as it was back in 2003 with the SARS virus, which it also covered up, that the people don't believe it. And when, and when they are dying, as they are, and they are trying to get the word out, uh, when the state comes in and squelches social media, when it arrests doctors and disappears those who critique General Secretary Xi Jinping, it does so out of fear because it knows that were the truth to fully come out, 
there could be a, a, a revolt or an uprising or something that would uh, put at risk the existence of the Communist Party. So what you see is a, is a very delicate balancing act it is always doing, which is to, to co-opt its elites, co-opt the military, make sure that the, the, the levers of power in society are on its side, but also use an extremely heavy hand against those inside and quite frankly, outside the country who dare to present a different picture from the official one of the Communist Party. Interesting. Lonnie, could you talk a little bit more about the specific reactions and responses of South Korea and Taiwan and from a public health point of view? And then maybe could you fold it into this geopolitical tension that exists between China and Taiwan and comment on that a little bit? Yeah. So, Tom, I think that when we think about the reaction to the coronavirus, what we hear often is that there are a number of countries and societies in East Asia uh, which have responded effectively to the challenges created by it. So we often hear about Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan as three examples. And I think they all sort of did their own mix of public policy interventions to create situations uh, that were efficient and effective at dealing with the virus. So one of the things that each of those uh, societies did was to think carefully about travel restrictions, first of all. Uh, Taiwan, for example, put in place very early on travel restrictions from Wuhan and then more generally from China because they're so close to the action. They realize the challenges created by the constant flow of people uh, at, between, the, the, between the two societies. And so they immediately uh, said, look, we're going to restrict travel. And then in a similar way, they had a robust public health infrastructure that allowed them to be able to determine who was infected with the virus. That meant effective testing. And of course, with testing, everyone talks about South Korea, the degree to which South Korea was able to deploy testing in different modalities very quickly and very broadly, which allowed them to identify, this is also very important, people who were carrying the virus either asymptomatically or with very mild symptoms. This enabled them to put in place more targeted quarantining. It enabled the ability to contact trace, which is tremendously time and resource intensive. Uh, very difficult for public health agencies here in the US to do it because they just don't have the time and the resources, particularly when the outbreak reaches epidemic proportions as it has in some parts of our country. And so South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore were all able to employ testing combined with contract contact tracing, combined with an effective campaign to notify people about restrictions. And, and the last thing I'll say is that a lot of those societies also very aggressively uh, promoted mask wearing, which is something here in the United States that has not been promoted broadly, in part because of a concern out of limiting the supply for medical professionals who need it. But increasingly, I think you're seeing a effort here in the US to promote mask wearing, not only because it will uh, help to, to stop the transmission of the disease amongst those who may be as asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, but also because we have evidence from these countries in East Asia that have tried this, that have really where mask wearing is quite common, that it may be assisting in dampening down the further transmission of the virus once the initial outbreak's been dealt with. So uh, a lot of these societies have given us a window into some of the very effective ways in which the coronavirus can be fought. And part of that comes from their experience dealing with the similar coronavirus in 2002, 2003, the so-called severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS, that experience for Taiwan in particular was very informative. Uh, you asked about the WHO, I'll just say briefly, one of the challenges has been the WHO has continued to deny Taiwan membership in the organization. The association and the discussions between the WHO and Taiwan remain relatively informal. Um, this is not what public health would suggest is the best answer. The best answer is broad information sharing, regardless of politics. The WHO has prioritized politics, unfortunately, over public health. Yeah, I got it. Uh, our colleague Russell Berman asked a question that's right on top of that, which is, uh, Li Wing Ling was the Wuhan doctor who tried to sound the alarm about the disease, but faced resistance from the Chinese government. Is there evidence of tension between the Chinese scientific community and the Communist Party. 
And, and Misha, I'm going to expand that a little bit. Is there general tension and uh, threats to the existing power structure in China because of this uh, infection? So great questions. And to, to the first one, um, it, it's hard. For the most part, of course, the, the scientific community, the medical community, any professional community, community in China is dependent on the party, right? I mean, you, you will not get funding. You will not have the ability to work in research institutes. You will not have the ability to have a, you know, have, have a job, you know, pursue your profession if you uh, go against the party. It doesn't mean, of course, everyone's a party member. Um, Dr. Lee was more than, than just faced pressure. He was threatened. Uh, he was basically put under house arrest. Of course, he died soon after that. Uh, and a report has just surfaced that the first doctor who tried to warn uh, the rest of China and, and then the world about this uh, disease also has disappeared, uh, along with other critique, uh, critics of the regime. So um, it's, it's at times like this that you do see the, the professional ethos among some in China and, and certainly people that we should consider heroes and people we should do whatever we can, if anything, to support coming up against the political reality of what the, the party wants in the same way that the party, uh, instead of spreading the word to people, how dangerous this was, shut down social media so people could not spread the word. Now, information's leaking out. We see uh, there are riots, for example, of people, the, the, the party, the government has said, Wuhan's an open city now, you can leave Wuhan. But people who are trying to leave Hebei province, where Wuhan is located, are being stopped at the borders by internal border guards who don't want them in their province, right? So the, the fiction, first of all, that the, the pandemic has taken its course in China is almost certainly not true. The Chinese just yesterday announced that they were undercounting the number of infections uh, because they weren't counting people who are asymptomatic. So that the true number of infections is probably vastly larger than, than what we heard. But people inside China do not believe the party, which is why the draconian measures are so important. That I think just quickly leads into your second question, your second point. Uh, is the party itself at risk? The party always feels that it's at risk. The party is worried about its own, uh, its own people. It's worried that its legitimacy is being undermined. Uh, it's worried that if it is exposed as, as not understanding uh, the, the severity of this and not being able uh, to act early on, that it put uh, greater China at risk, let alone the rest of the world. Um, there, there is a, a, uh, a tension that is building between the propaganda front that the party has very carefully cultivated over this and the slow but steady breaking of the dam, that information is coming out, even official information, such as announcing that they're gonna include asymptomatic people. One thing very interesting just to note is that the people of Wuhan themselves have been doing crowdsourcing by watching crematoria activity to try to figure out how many people have died and a widely accepted figure that is going around social media from people all putting in their different information uh, and about the urns that they're getting back is that 46,000 people died in Wuhan alone. Now, don't forget, the Communist Party told us that only 3,300 died in the entire country. So the truth is coming out slowly. We'll never know the full extent, but as it does so, it creates dangers and tensions for the Communist Party. That is why they are using every method they can every outlet they can to spread the positive word. And unfortunately, there are too many here in the United States and the West who believe them and are parroting their line. Interesting. Just in terms of the truth getting out, Lan He or, or Misha, have you heard anything more about steps the Chinese government is taking to slow the spread of the virus? Are they open for business totally? Are they shutting down things? Uh, I read in Shenzhen, they shut down restaurants, for example. I don't, you know, I don't know if that's true or not. What, what are you guys hearing about what's going on there? Well, the, the initial response, of course, was very aggressive. Um, the, the quarantine that was put into effect, particularly around Wuhan and around Hubei province, uh, those were very blunt instruments that the Communist Party of China was able to, to engage in. And, and recall that they have the ability to understand what people are doing via monitoring and surveillance in a way that we, we probably don't in the United States or at least shouldn't uh, from, a, from a legal perspective. And so they were able to determine people's movements, whether in fact quarantines were being observed properly, 
uh, things like temperature checks, they could do much more aggressively. So there's every indication that once they did decide to shut it down, they really did do everything to shut it down because they had the capacity to do so. Now we can question whether that came too late in the game, whether in fact allowing people to travel over the Lunar New Year holiday was a good idea given that the virus had already seeded pretty significantly in, uh, in Wuhan and in surrounding areas. So, so I think they have been able to do that. In terms of whether they've reopened or not, uh, I, I do think that there is an effort to bring the Chinese economy online precisely because of how, how much carnage the coronavirus inflicted on the Chinese economy during the first quarter of this year. I think they are desperately looking to get the Chinese economy back up and running. But the challenge in doing that is anytime you bring uh, you know, a billion or so people back into a workforce, you're going to create challenges around the virus then spreading again, around creating different outbreak areas. So I think that they have experienced some of the start and stop, start and stop that we in the U.S. really want to avoid. And I think from an economic perspective it would be wise for us to avoid because the challenge is people don't have trust that the conditions are safe for them. And if they don't have trust the conditions are safe for them, it's not going to be business as usual. Got it. Uh, Benjamin asked the following question. China is currently undergoing a very public effort to provide medical help and equipment to other countries. Does this constitute a Belt and Road style attempt to exploit the pandemic to build Chinese soft power abroad? Yes, it yeah. does. It does. Uh, and in fact, a lot of that aid is being sold. It's not being given. Spain, for example, bought uh, around $500 million worth of equipment. Um, so China is, is out there sending off these boxes. It looks a little bit like old Marshall Plan stuff, but there are always strings attached. Um, in, in certain cases, there are direct financial strings attached. You have to pay for this. Uh, and we also know that Spain, Czech Republic, uh, Malaysia, other countries are returning some of the equipment that they bought because it's useless. A lot of the tests are 70% are, are useless. So China's making money off of this, but is also providing um, faulty equipment. That's number one. Number two is exactly to the, to the, uh, the question's uh, point about the one belt, one road. There is always a, a cost. Uh, there is always a quid pro quo involved in taking aid from China. We, we've seen that all along uh, the, the, the course of, of China's extension of its trade and political relations around the world. Um, and when you see the, you know, the president of Serbia blessing China uh, and you see the Italians saying that these are our brothers, um, you, you better believe there's going to be a quid pro quo. We saw it, for example, with Greece who squelched an EU statement on human rights uh, when they had received an enormous amount of trade from China. Czech Republic did the same thing. We've, we've seen turnarounds on the part of countries all around the world who don't want to lose what they believe is a, a secure source of funding from the Communist Party from China. And if you have to compromise on, on liberal values, if you have to self-censor, uh, if your companies don't, for example, recognize Taiwan or you don't recognize Taiwan anymore, that's the price that they're willing to pay. So we are going to see more of that, but it is a very dangerous moment for the arsonist that burned down the house to be hailed as the firefighter who saved it. That's exactly what's happening. For Italy, which has 310,000 Chinese residents, many of them located in the north where the manufacturing is, which is precisely where the Wuhan virus hit the hardest in Italy, for the Italians to praise the Chinese for helping them through the crisis that they themselves created is, uh, it means that we cannot have a normal style of international political relations. And the United States has to think very hard now, very carefully about how we go forward with relations with China, because quite frankly, if we don't make some sort of change, then we will put ourselves at risk for things like this happening again and again. Yeah, that's, um, yeah go ahead, Lonnie. I was just gonna to add to that and, and, and say that the, the economic uh, ways in which China has exerted its power and influence over the last several years become manifest when you look, for example, at what's happened. We talked about the World Health Organization and we talked about the degree to which China has had influence there. And, and there are some points at which that influence becomes quite direct. So the current person who runs the WHO was the foreign minister and the health minister of Ethiopia. 
at a time when China deployed billions of dollars in direct assistance and loan guarantees to Ethiopia for infrastructure projects and other things. So there are different ways in which this influence interconnects. And it all serves the greater goal, of course, of advancing China's interests, not only in places like Ethiopia, which may seem random to the casual observer, but in fact are part of a more organized way to advance China's interests, not just in those places, but in international fora like the World Health Organization for just such a moment as this. Mm -hmm. Uh, Misha touched on it, but Edward asked the following question, and this question, we can take the rest of our time with this, is where do we go from here with our relationship with China? I mean, is it fair to characterize we've been in, our relationship with China has been one in which we've tried to invite them into the community of nations till now? Is that fundamentally going to change? And then at a very granular level, what's going to happen to trade? What's going to happen to international cooperation, et cetera? What do you see going forward? Misha, we'll start with you. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the political part in particular, and then, you know, Lanhee can, can uh, grab onto the other stuff. Um, look, we're not going to, uh, we're not going to break diplomatic relations with China. We're not going to unwind uh, where we, what we've done for the past 40 years. But Tom, you're exactly right. The overarching strategy of the United States for the past 40 years, 50 years, has been to engage with China and increasingly bring it into the, the global system. I, you know, it wasn't so long ago that it wasn't all that involved with many of these international organizations, you know, just a few decades ago. Now it is. Um, but we can't do it anymore on, on the, on, in, in the way that we've been doing it, which has been simply to accept whatever Chinese, China says. When we say China, we're talking about the government of China. Mm. Um, we can't do it in a way that, that we ignore China's bad faith actions, uh, that we ignore its lies. I mean, I think it's, it's time where we have to put an asterisk next to China globally, right? Which means uh, there's more to the truth than what you're seeing here, right? That's where we put an asterisk on something to say, keep looking because there's something else going on, right? Um, whether it's lying about uh, the amount of, of cyber hacking that it's done, as well as its promises to stop it, lying about not militarizing the islands it built in the South China Sea, and then going ahead and militarizing them, lying about the size of its economy, overstating its economic growth by at least 15%, um, lying about the incarceration of Uyghur Muslims. Over and over and over, the world has accepted at face value what China said. Now, the time for that is over. You need to put an asterisk next to China, next to what the government of China says. The question then is, what do we do about it? Well, I think we're, we need to demand reciprocity uh, in, our, in our dealings with China. First of all, you have to verify everything that comes out. You can no longer trust at face value. You need to verify to the extent that you can, or at a minimum, you can't act as though what they're telling you is true, and therefore you, you would do something that, that you would do if it were true, i.e., well, this is not a virus that can be transmitted between humans, so we act one way. Versus saying, well, you know what, China lied in 2003, it lied in 2020, we need to protect ourselves. So that's, that's one thing. Second thing is this question of reciprocity. Reciprocity does not mean that we become like China. It means that we demand equality in our relations, that they treat us the same way that we treat them. Whether that's the number of reporters that, that they allow in their country and therefore we allow, whether it's student access, uh, whether it's the American uh, centers being equal to the number of Confucius Institutes. Uh, it, it's all of that because we have allowed China to take advantage of our open system, to take advantage of our willingness and our desire to bring it into the global economy. And we have not only been harmed by its blatant stealing of intellectual property and the like, but we are now physically and materially harmed by the lies that it, and I want to repeat this, it freely chose no one in the world, no organization in the world forced China to lie about coronavirus. No one forced it to cover up the truth. No one forced it to lie to the WHO. It chose that course freely. And morally, there should be repercussions for it. Politically, there should be repercussions for it. Lonnie? Well, uh, you know, look, I think that the, the answer is we must be clear-eyed about the challenges that China faces in the international order, the degree to which we have and, and espouse different worldviews. Um, and, and that will influence exactly how the two countries end up interacting with one another. 
And the answer is not to accede to a worldview that is fundamentally at odds with our own. The answer is to say, we believe that our system can work better. We believe that our values are important and worth, worth uh, uh, upholding and being very clear about what those values are. I think one of the challenges is over these last several decades, frankly, has been we have desperately wanted uh, for China to become just like one of the other players in the world economy, mm -hmm. just like one of the one of the teams, so to speak. And I, I think China has been playing a fundamentally different game. I think they have realized uh, from very early on that they had the opportunity, first of all, to exert regional hegemony. And I think that has been the goal that they've sought after. And frankly, I think you can say that they have achieved that goal or um, to be less charitable, maybe that they're within striking range of that goal. And so really the challenge for us in the United States is how do we construct a relationship that recognizes there are things we can possibly cooperate on. There are ways in which our economy should work together to the benefit of both the Chinese people and the American people. Mm -hmm. But that cannot be done if we are not clear about what China is doing, the ways in which they are doing it, their methods. And, and I think the more information comes out, we are a transparent society here in the United States. And I think that transparency can only be to the benefit, not only of us, but of the international community as well. Yeah. Samuel asks the following question. Um, how would you respond to Chinese claims that the virus originated in the United States? I, I mean, first of all, this is, uh, it, it, it is, this is sort of propaganda in the extreme that has been deployed in a way that is almost unbelievable. Now it'd be one thing if it were being spread amongst certain audiences within the People's Republic of China. What to me has been most uh, problematic is the degree to which official agents of the government of the People's Republic of China, people who are high officials in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the People's Republic of China, have actually been saying that uh, this virus actually came from the United States or it came from the US Army. Uh, unsubstantiated claims that are not supported by the epidemiological evidence, that are not supported by the initial patterns of spread of the virus, that are not supported uh, by any of the anecdotal evidence that we have from China and from other places. The notion that somehow this is acceptable or okay uh, to me is, is, is ludicrous. And the fact that it would come from the, from the government, not just from some random sources in Chinese society, to me speaks volumes about uh, what the PRC is trying to do at this time and place. Misha, anything to add? All I would say is I, I agree completely with Lonnie, and that's why I think we cannot let relations go back just the way that they were. All mm -hmm. it's forgiven and forgotten. They have blamed us. They've blamed our military for, for creating this and spreading it. Uh, that's not the action of a, of a friendly country. It's the action of an adversary uh, and one that is dangerous uh, because it, there are people who believe this and will continue to believe it. So uh, we, need to, we need to rethink just the degree to uh, how we interact. Um, do we simply have all these meetings with China just because it's a good thing to have meetings? Well, maybe not anymore. Maybe, maybe not so much good comes out of it or maybe that hamstrings us from, from speaking truth to power. So yeah, this, this, there are a lot of lessons to learn once we get over the hump here mm -hmm. about how to protect ourselves, but also how not to be taken advantage of by China. Yeah. Daniel asked a good question. Uh, he says, some have posited that the COVID-19 crisis has revealed the dangers of relying on China for numerous supply chains, most significantly the pharmaceutical supply chain. As concerning as the pharmaceutical issues are, what are your thoughts about what this crisis reveals about our dependency on China? Lonnie, you could start and I'll follow in. Yeah, I mean, clearly there is a, there's a challenge when you realize that the amount of protective equipment, the pharmaceutical supply chain, all of them are intricately linked with China. Uh, my view tends to be that a, a lot of the shifting in supply chains, at least maybe not in those areas specifically, but outside of those areas, a lot of the supply chain has already shifted to other parts of the world, whether Southeast Asia, in the case of pharmaceuticals, India as well. Um, I, I have concerns about 
the US federal government coming in and enforcing that supply chains ought to shift in one way or another, I would much prefer for that decision to be reached when you know, sort of folks and private actors realize that China uh, represents some fundamental instability in supply chains. And I think you're already seeing some of that. So my view is that um, you know, we are at a place now where we are realizing and recognizing the challenges, particularly as it pertains to pharmaceuticals and to PPE of having that link to China. Uh, let's give the private sector uh, actors the opportunity to make those shifts and make those changes without a sort of heavy handed policy response at this time. I'll disagree a little bit with, with Lanhi on this. I, I certainly uh, agree, I think he's right that, that some of these supply chains have started to shift, um, but it's hard. Uh, you know, it's what we call decoupling. And, and while it has been happening, and by the way, if you can remember all the way back to January when we were talking about the trade war, which now seems like a distant memory, we were talking about decoupling because of the trade war. Um, it's hard. I mean, China has done an extraordinary job over the past 30 years of building up its infrastructure, its skilled labor force and the like, so that it's really the only uh, partner of choice for so many companies. And, and that has been an imbalance in the global uh, economic system and an imbalance in the supply chain. Uh, it's meant other countries can't, haven't been able to rise up uh, the, the value added chain because China was just so efficient. Now, some of that has been undone, as Lan he was talking about. But it's hard, first of all, to move a lot of these things. And more importantly, um, I think what we need to do is decide which are the really critical industries that we cannot trust to China for the supply chain. And Lan he mentioned pharmaceutical, active pharmaceutical ingredients, um, the protective equipment, but other things, rare earths, uh, things that the US military is dependent on for China from transistors to rubber. So I think what we need to do is, is give business some time uh, to figure out how it's going to, to remove some of these vulnerabilities from our system, uh, whether that's 18 months or 24 months or 36 months. And then we have to do a, a, a health check and see whether they've done it or not and whether we are therefore more uh, independent and, and more self-sufficient in this than we have been until now. And if not, then I think you need a slightly heavier hand of government, not to come in and tell you where to make your Nikes, but to tell you where to make your active pharmaceutical ingredients or get your rare earths from. I think it's time because we see the danger of too much reliance on China. We should have seen it before. There's no excuse anymore. Yeah. Uh, Ron asked a question about uh, China-Hong Kong relations. I mean, they were, they were strained before this happened. How has the COVID crisis impacted that and how do you see that going forward? Well, it's funny. I mean, what we were all, again, just a few months ago, so focused on, on the, the brave Hong Kongers and the uh, demonstrations, millions of people out in the streets. Um, unfortunately, I actually think China played that fairly well. Uh, they did not overreact. They did not invade. They did not use a heavy hand. Um, they waited for the protests to begin dying down. There were always flare-ups, but for the most part, they avoided the real danger of having to do a Tiananmen-style uh, intervention. And, and some people argue that's because it simply was not uh, it, it was not existential to them. Uh, you know, Carrie Lam is is still the 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 chief executive, but she backed down. So. They got to a, a basic modus vivendi, at least for a while. Uh, what's interesting, of course, is that this has uh, helped uh, shut everything down, right? And, and, and Hong Kong, which had a huge hit from SARS, immediately went down into lockdown protective mode. And so that's, that's bought China time. It's going to buy it probably uh, at least half a year, if not more. And then you have to see, do the protests come back? Um, and again, on top of that, then, is the propaganda picture. Do the Hong Kongers look at what mainland China did and decide that, no, that was completely appropriate and they actually acted very well to contain this virus? Mm -hmm. Or do they take the view that, no, we were all put at risk because uh, the Communist Party lied and, and covered it up? Then you'll start to see this, this fusing again with that sense of Hong Kong or saying we don't want to be a part of China. But right now, I would say it's completely up in the air. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add that, you know, one of the things we, we've seen over the last few years is already the, the economic heft of Hong Kong as a, as a financial center in the region has been diminishing. Uh, they've lost market share to Singapore and frankly to Shanghai in the Chinese mainland. And the combination of the protests really shutting down Hong Kong, as well as this coronavirus crisis further shuttering Hong Kong, 
means that that migration will only hasten. That in fact, we're gonna see less and less commercial activity around Hong Kong and more in other areas. And so what becomes of Hong Kong uh, in, in the future, I think is a, is a big question. But it is clear that if you look at the economy of Hong Kong, it's been devastated over these last six months. Coronavirus plus the protests, uh, Cafe Pacific Airways, the, the flag carrier of Hong Kong has had to significantly curtail activities as many other air carriers have, but is emblematic of the degree to which Hong Kong's economy has suffered. Yeah, we had a couple questions that ask you to evaluate the Trump administration's performance vis-a-vis -vis China. One, Lon, he relates to the growing influence of China in the World Health Organization. Is that a modern phenomenon or what's the history of that? And then the other one, probably for you, Misha, is from Marcus. It says, to what extent has Trump in the U.S. compromised in its dealings with China vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, U.S. naval presence, and other issues? So, Lonnie, why don't you go with it? Yeah, so, so I'll start by talking about uh, China's influence activities in multilateral organizations. This is something that's been um, recurring and has been a big focus of China, which is how to install influence in leadership positions of key organizations. Earlier, Misha identified a few of them. ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, the World Health Organization. These are just two examples. Um, they've been very effective at uh, using the levers of power to ensure that their agenda and their interests are well represented. And the WHO is a perfect example of this. So the current director general of the WHO, a guy named Dr. Tedros, was the foreign minister of Ethiopia, as well as the, uh, the health minister of Ethiopia at a time when China invested heavily in Ethiopia. So that relationship was there. Then China backed him very strongly when he ran for director general against a candidate from the UK, actually. So by putting influence into these organizations, China is able to control the agenda. But more importantly, when a crisis does hit, China is able to ensure that its point of view is not only reflected, but unquestioned. We've talked a little bit about how the WHO reaffirmed China's finding on January the 14th that this virus, the coronavirus, COVID-19, could not be transmitted from human to human. Rather than independently investigating and pushing China on that, the WHO simply acceded to China's finding. That is one example, and it may have seemed subtle at the time, but a very important example of how China's influence within the WHO led to some very dramatic public health consequences. And so going forward, I would say the Trump administration has done a great job, first of all, of calling this out, but second all of directly putting in place a special envoy in the State Department, whose job it is to look after the degree to which China has influenced these international organizations, but more importantly, how the United States can counteract that. That's the next step, right? We cannot simply allow this to continue. The answer is not just to wring our hands. We've actually got to get in there and actively try to influence these international organizations. And if that doesn't work, we need to be prepared to walk away and start over. Yeah. yeah I think the, the Trump administration has been the first U.S. administration to really call out China for its predatory behavior, its malign influence in, uh, around the world, uh, and rock them back on their heels. Uh, but that goes back to the beginning of, of the administration. Um, I, I think to some degree, any U.S. president would have done that somewhat because the national debate was changing. But clearly, Donald Trump took it much farther than anyone else. The best example until now, of course, having been uh, the, the trade war. Um, to the point about international organizations, very briefly, by the way, um, the U.S. Uh, just recently defeated a Chinese bid to have one of their people put in at the head of the international patent organization. Uh, or copyright organizations, so that that uh, China would essentially would have had access to the entire world's patents and and, and copyrights um, patents, um, and that that was that was truly important because it showed the beginning uh, finally of of a concerted push to recognize the dangers of having China lead up groups like the ICAO or have the influence that it has in, in WHO. On Taiwan, the administration's gone farther than any administration since the normalization of relations with China in 1979. You know, Jimmy Carter's administration precipitously cut relations with Taiwan, uh, turning it into a, you know, a, a sort of ghostly non-state on the international scene. Uh, China has since then steadily eaten away at Taiwan's support. 
The United States, while still not formally recognizing Taiwan, though under the Trump administration has gone farther than any other one to uh, deepen relations, bring, China, uh, bring Taiwan into the international community, uh, sell upgraded military equipment such as F-16s, things that are uh, advanced F-16s. These are very, very uh, important. Um, it is always a balance. It is always a challenge for U.S. administrations to deal with China in terms of issues that China considers central to its, its, national, uh, its national interests, right? Things like, like Taiwan. Um, but this makes clear, I think, the degree to which we cannot trust the Chinese government. We cannot trust the Communist Party. That you must consider your own interests first because they will not take them into account. And in fact, whether it's something as, as simple, can we call it, uh, as stealing private information and intellectual property to as deadly as unleashing an unknown pathogen on the world, you must now change the way you deal with China. And if we don't do that, and if we let it get away with earning the praise of the world for what it's done in this crisis, then we will not only be more vulnerable, we will be in a much worse position going forward for the next generation. Interesting. Well, gentlemen, we've reached the end of the line here. Would you care to make any concluding comments, Lonhee? Well, look, I think this is a, a critical time, not just in terms of what we're dealing with with the coronavirus, but I would say some of the issues that Misha and I have discussed, they will endure beyond this crisis. We will, we will get beyond this crisis. We will uh, hopefully be successful at dealing with it. But the challenges created by our bilateral relationship with China, and you know, I focus a little bit more on the public health side, uh, really, I think, need to be addressed. And U.S. policymakers need to take a, a firmer hand in thinking about how we deal with our relationship with China in the context of these international organizations. And in particular, I think the implications are, are quite significant. Uh, we're not talking about uh, things that are, that are of, of small or trivial nature. We're talking about life and death matters. And so for the public health of, of our society, as well as others, uh, I do hope that these issues are taken seriously. Misha? Uh, very simply, buyer beware. Or we could call it hashtag China the asterisk. Just beware. Don't, don't buy what's coming out. Protect yourself, literally, your loved ones, your way of life. Because we've seen now what it means to take things at face value and the dangers in a globalized world that it entails. It's going to be a tough time, I think, as we try to figure out now, not unwinding all of globalization or U.S.-China relations, but what is prudent, what's appropriate, because we cannot go through this again, uh, and we cannot allow China to rewrite history, to falsify what's happened in order to prevent us from protecting ourselves the next time. Got it. Thank you, Misha and Lonhe. Fabulous discussion. We really appreciate it. Thank I want to thank all of you for attending as well. Our next virtual policy briefing will be tomorrow, Friday, April 3rd at 11 a.m. Pacific and 2 p.m. Eastern with Eddie Lazier for a special briefing to respond to what's expected to be a very significant unemployment report announced uh, today or tomorrow. Eddie is the Morris Arnold and Nona Jean Cox Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Davies Family Professor of Economics at Sanford's Graduate School of Business. He's a labor economist who served at the White House as President George W. Bush's chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. You can join tomorrow's briefing at the same link you signed in on today. If you'd like to see more fellow analysis on the coronavirus, please go to our website, hoover.org, where we have a section dedicated to COVID-19 research. Again, I want to thank you for attending today's briefing. I want to wish you all the health and welfare, and please enjoy the rest of the day. Goodbye.